And I'll ask the secretary to call the roll. Senator Rocky Adams, Senator Boswell, Senator Deneen, yeah. Senator Harper Angel, yeah. Senator Webb, yeah. Representative Brown, Representative King. Present. Representative Pratt. Present. Representative Reed. Here. Representative Rourkes. Here. Senator Mays Bledsoe. Here. And Representative Dossett. Present. That quorum. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I'm going to defer the co-chair to Representative Dossett for an introduction of guests. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, we have a new member of our staff that is with us this morning. We would like to welcome Emily Riley. We're looking forward to working with you and uh, know you'll do a fantastic job. So welcome. Thank you. It's nice to have you here with us today. Um, first, I'd like to motion on the minutes uh, from the April 13th meeting. Motion. Thank you. Second. And a second. All those in favor of approving the minutes will vote aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Those minutes are approved. Now we'll move on to our agenda. And I think we have um, Mr. Lacefield here with us. Mr. McCloskey, if you want to come forward and start your presentation and update on the Ag Development Board. Well, good morning, and thank you, Madam Chair. It's good to be with you all today and uh, share with what's going on at the uh, Office of Ag Policy and oversight of the Ag Development Funds. I was chatting right before the meeting started with my friend back there, Jeff Harper, and he asked how things were going, and uh, Bill said, going well, the money hit the account. So that's the first thing I can report is the uh, MSA payments are uh, are in and have been allocated. They've been received and allocated uh, to the uh, the counties, $45,554,774 with 29.3 at the state level and 16.2 going out to our counties. Uh, that's down slightly uh, from from last year, uh, but uh, the the inflation component of that factor has kept this a lot higher. Overall, national cigarette consumption was down 10 percent last year, but uh, with the inflation component, it kept it from being as a big of a decline as it as it was. So, with these uh, the, these dollars being allocated in, we are in peak uh, peak season now with county council meetings uh literally uh going across the state uh as uh, folks are having their their meetings and uh deciding initial allocation of these funds at the county level i was uh looking this morning at the schedule and next week one day alone we have county council meetings in washington floyd franklin Lyon, and garrett county so that's a pretty good uh, bit of uh travel as we're we're trying to cover uh and, and have staff attend each and every one of these and that's what uh, thankfully we're back to our our, our full staff at what we're calling full staff today uh, and uh, have uh, have one of our newest colleagues with us today Savannah Hill is uh, is with us she joined last uh, last month and uh, we've already uh, got her going to county council uh, meetings on her own and uh, and doing that she's uh, from Nelson County she's a University of Kentucky Ag Econ grad and a beef producer so uh, we're we're excited to have her on our team and uh, and, and help to, to get around and cover the these, uh, these different county council meetings. I always joke that it would be nice if we could start maybe in Fulton and just work our way uh, across the state, but they happen as applications come in and as needs arise. One of the, uh, the projects that uh, has been funded since 2019 is the state allocation of, uh, uh, limited, of state funds to limited allocation counties. This uh, program was set up to, to bring all of our counties up to a certain level of funding because the allocation of these funds, as we talked, uh, I believe last month I was with you, that it's, uh, it's broken down based on their their historic burley dependency t tied to number of burley tobacco bases or quota we had at the time, the pounds of tobacco that were produced there in the, the late 90s, and then how much that, that tobacco dollar impacted a local community. And two of our counties, Pike and Knott, received none. But there's other counties that uh, that historically had very little uh, on, on that. I think Martin County would be the, the lowest county that actually receives funds. Their allocation, based on the formula that was established uh, when the, the county allocations went out with, with House Bill 611, is $55 for this year. 
So uh, they, they would still, these, these counties still have to have uh, uh, priorities, have still have to have county council meetings and talk about that. But in 2019, the state board made the decision to bring all counties up to at least $30,000. So that would work out like Martin County would receive $29,945. And then Marshall County, for example, uh, their, their allocation this year would be 29254 So they got $746 that brought them up to 30000 This was 21 counties. Uh, they're the majority of them are in our far west and our far east counties. So this has been a, a great way to, to further spread these dollars across the state. And I just uh, continue every year when we, we do have these funds. Uh, want to, to thank you all as a committee and then uh, all on behalf of the, the total General Assembly that you serve continue appreciation for the allocation of these funds to agriculture. They are truly making a difference across Kentucky and our communities. Uh, we had last uh, uh, month had our April approved loans. Uh, that would be your first uh, page we have in the packet. We had two of our infrastructure loan programs. We had seven of our beginning farm programs, one ag processing, and one, uh, the acronym is DEAL, that's for the diversification entrepreneurship uh, through agriculture, and that is our ag business program for things that wouldn't fit in our other programs, and uh, uh, and this one was actually one uh, an innovative uh, group utilizing drones for uh, for application. And I know Chairman Dawson, he and I both had some ag retail experience at uh, different times uh, crossing through, but that's where we're at now with uh, with the technology of uh, delivering uh, uh, this this application via drones. We utilized uh, all three of our farm credit systems. We have three in Kentucky, River Valley Ag, Central Kentucky Ag Credit, and Farm Credit Mid-America. All three uh, last month participated with us, two of our frequent flyers uh, with uh, our community banks, and then one of our area development districts, which we also work with them uh, with the participations. Uh, so a total of $1.8 million, but uh, as I always like to report, this was, uh, this, this was perhaps the, the catalyst uh, to, to get over $10 million in total capital investments. Uh, and again, we spread, spread the state uh, with, uh, with these. And Senator Webb, uh, you talked last uh, last month. We we talked about, and you you used your phrase. I love to hear about our international model that we've become with this program. But uh, we 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 participate in the National Council of State Ag Finance Programs. Uh, Bill has served in leadership positions with this in his tenure, and because of the success of this program, we're seeing interest from other states. Uh, Bill, Bill and I were just chatting this morning, and and here in the last few months, we have had Zoom calls with leadership in Maryland, Alabama, and Delaware all looking at our program and how they could they could do something similar so uh, just again a testament to uh, to the vision from from ag leadership and the general assembly to to set forth these funds and i will stop there and then bill and i'll tag team through uh, what else was approved last month okay start with page three give you an update on the programs that were approved so at the top of the list is the cape program county agriculture investment program you can see that $718,927 in county money to support the CAPE program, the 11 different investment areas from making improvements to structures on the farm, uh, hay barns to purchase some bulls to just about everything. Uh, fencing is always a popular cost share item. Now, if you notice, Letcher County has an asterisk there, so we're, we will denote those counties that are receiving state money, as, as Brian mentioned earlier. So their allocation on an annual basis is $92. So... Based on receiving money this year and last year, this will be the third year, they're going to be able to commit $40,000 to a cost share program in Letcher County. And as I reported in uh, previous meetings, most popular cost share item right now is boundary fencing because, again, Representative King, that's not eligible on a consistent basis with any other state programs or, or federal programs. So that's very popular to help support farmers that may or landowners that may be willing to upgrade uh, fencing maybe it's 50 years old they can upgrade their fencing or uh, section off new part of their fencing from the woods and increase their cattle operation and as you all know our mission for 22 years now is diversifying away from tobacco most of your tobacco producers have cattle so this will help them expand their cattle operation it goes towards improving the net farm income moving on to the de deceased Farm and removal program, two counties were approved for $19,000. So this just supports best management practice with regards to the de deceased animal program. Under shared use equipment, so the counties can utilize county money to purchase equipment that may not be 
feasible for a, a landowner or farmer to uh, purchase. So to give you an idea of some of the equipment here, we'll start with the first one. Henry County, most popular uh, piece of equipment to, to buy on a cost share basis where it's available on a rental basis to farmers in the county. The first one in Henry County is a no-till drill. The second one for $9,750 is a post hole driver. So that helps them utilize the and, and uh, improve the fencing. And then under Madison County, lime spreader. We're seeing more interest in being able to rent a lime spreader to help spread fertilize lime spread lime. And then lastly, we've got a hay wrapper in Madison County. So there was uh, several years ago, there was a UK publication said that if you can get your hay stored or protected from the weather, increase the 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 quality, not only the quality, but the volume by 30%. So that allows you to feed a third more cattle if you're able to protect your hay. And then under the youth program, two counties approved for $95,000 for a total of $906,064. Moving on to page four, we've got two counties that amended their current CAPE program. So you can see with Barron County Conservation District, they were approved back in uh, September for $350,000. So now they're coming back and asked for $93,000. Probably they have a year to disperse the funds and close the program. So they'll be coming up on a year here to finish up the program. But they probably got some producers on waiting list. And if, if they can add additional $93,000, they can go ahead and fund those uh, applicants that are on the waiting list. And the same thing with uh, Caldwell Lyon County Cattlemen Association in Caldwell County. They're just asking for additional $1,390 to address their waiting list. And next is page five. Brian's going to. All right. Thank you. This was a unique project with the Bluegrass Land Conservancy, a uh, nonprofit uh, entity that works for preservation of farmland. Uh, this this uh, project was uh, was awarded funds of four hundred and nine thousand nine hundred fifty dollars that will go towards a bigger uh, project with uh, um, the USDA NRCS. Additional funding came out of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act at the federal level that has increased uh, funding available for, uh, again, the, the purchase of um, the development rights for, for this, uh, this property. The way these, these easements work is you're, you're restricting forever, uh, perpetuity, the, uh, the development of this property, thus keeping it in agriculture land. And this obviously has a, um, a hit to the, the fair market value of this, so uh, landowners are able to, uh, to be compensated the difference between the, uh, the fair market value, which would reflect development opportunity, and then the agriculture use. One of the things in putting together these type of conservation easements, uh, I had a board member used uh, the, the term and I liked it, said you want to think more like Holsteins instead of Dalmatians. You want big, big, big spots uh, and, and contiguous lands together instead of just little dots uh, spread out across the state. So they strategically work to put these together. Uh, this this part of our funding actually goes to paying the closing cost on on these easements to, to happen. But looking at possibly bringing in a total of twenty eight million dollars at the federal level uh, with the use of these funds, they they have ten point four secured and have another pending application that's being reviewed. But it's customary from uh, in, in most of my, my banking deals I worked with for the buyer to always pay the closing cost. You want to ensure it's your attorney for getting you clear title. You want to ensure an independent appraiser, appraiser that's coming in and establishing that value. And that's the way the, the federal program runs. It, uh, it precludes these funds for being used for closing cost. So that's what the, the 400000 is going to, to pay the closing cost on getting the, the total amount, again, up to $28 million that will go uh, to purchase these development easements on between four uh, to up to 16,000 acres in Kentucky. And this Bluegrass Land Conservancy, they work in a, uh, uh, a 26 county area here in central Kentucky. Just a second, we have one question. Representative King. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you all for, for bringing this to our attention. I just have a quick question about permanent conservation easements. Are they documented on the deed or does a purchaser know that that 
permanent conservation easement is attached to the property. Can you help me learn well, a that, little bit more the, about it, that? It would be in the deed, and uh, and I've I've worked through some of these again as a banker and the closing attorney always uh, in the my my cases uh, and represented also would be uh, David Cutoff uh, if you can imagine him telling the story would all, always go through. Now you understand what forever means. <laughs> this is this is not just this generation. This is this is going on uh, for for perpetuity, and that would uh, that would be upon anybody doing their due diligence uh, to, to research that there's not anything else of public record that I'm aware of besides putting it in the deed thank you thank you for the clarification thank you madam chair seeing none of those please proceed all right next next we're on page six it's the drone agra of Kentucky LLC this was an application made to the Woodford County Agriculture Development Council for half the cost so the request was sixteen thousand one hundred one hundred forty seven dollars for a total of project cost of $32,294. So this was presented to the County Agriculture Development Council. And the, you can see that the plan is to be able to use an aerial application of either a, a fertilizer or any kind of a product to control disease and in, in insects. And the benefit is, obviously, if it's wet, you can't get in the field, you can use a, a drone. And as explained to me yesterday, visiting with a Nicholas County producer to some insects like army worms, they don't, they're don't. they most active at night. And he said you could spray with aerial a drone at night and do a better job of con controlling, uh, the, in this example, uh, army worms. So after much discussion, the county council decided only to commit $5,000 to the project and ultimately the Ag Development Board supported that commitment of $5,000. No questions, I'll move on to page seven. So it's the Madison County Farm Bureau requesting $3,896.62, which is the half the cost to purchase green bin rescue equipment. I think we presented many of these uh, is part of the our report to the oversight committee this is the one that we example we would like to see that it doesn't get used a whole lot but it's a safety equipment in more counties uh, representative reed are utilizing these uh, county funds to support this kind of endeavor and next we'll go to page eight suburban county fair and horse show requested twenty five thousand dollars in county funds to support a fifty thousand dollar improvement in the electricity panels concrete wash rack and other details of part of a new livestock barn it's going to be funded out of the kentucky department of agriculture their fairs and shows uh, program they can provide up to a hundred thousand dollars so they're going to use part of that money to match these specific improvements as part of their new livestock barn all right chair Dossett has a question for you bill and brian i want to go back to the uh uh what was uh uh done for the drones the uh approval on that what's the timeline that they will actually start operating or was were, were we told anything when i think they would actually... we plan on doing this year identified five counties that he would be able to start immediately there's not that a would be of... interesting uh, uh, to see to see those that, that that machinery actually operating right there. I uh, always go back and think of seeing the planes and the helicopters flying over there at home, and uh, it would be interesting to see how they're going to do that with the drones. But well, well and that that discussion came up uh, even even more. Uh, some of these fields that'll be serviced would mm -hmm. not be big enough uh, for even to get uh, the traditional aerial application. So beyond maybe a more efficient, we're actually going to be able to target uh, farm operations that wouldn't have access to this. Okay, I perfect. think it'll be more interesting. Sounds like a field trip is in your future. Well, that was what <laughs> Representative Reed just suggested, and uh, I think it would be. No. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Please proceed. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Webb has a question. I'd be glad to volunteer my acreage in Woodford County to get rid of those buttercups <laughs> around March, so it's <laughs> just saying. Well, that but wouldn't be a far it, drive. It's so exciting. I'm... It's exciting. <laughs> okay, now proceed. Okay, I think we're on page nine now. Okay, you'd finished that one, so we're good. All right, on page nine, we have a uh, project uh, from Murray State uh, University Center of Ag uh, Agricultural Hemp. 
Kentucky was a pioneer uh, in hemp to, to, with uh, the passing of the 2014 Farm Bill. We, uh, we I think, had six producers uh, that, that year raising raising hemp and continued uh, as, uh, as interest in this crop uh, grew. Early on, the Ag Development Board decided to make an investment in one project of each of the three primary uses, with our fiber, with uh, seed for human consumption, and then the CBD uh, production that, uh, that gained in, in popularity leading up to 2019. Then they established a policy that any future projects would be limited to education and research and must be tied to a university. Uh, Murray State uh, University early on established itself as a leading university with, uh, with work in, in hemp and established the Center for Agricultural, uh, Agricultural Hemp. Located in, uh, in, in Callaway County there near Murray is Hempwood, which is the only uh, company, to, to what I understand, in the world that is producing hardwood floors out of, out of hemp material, out of the fiber, and are successfully doing this and are struggling sourcing the hemp at the, the local level. There were many producers that had very negative experiences raising hemp, and uh, there are limited risk management tools available like we have with traditional uh, row crops that these acres would be replacing. So this application came to us as a collaborative effort between growers, between the university there at Murray State and uh, the Hempwood Company to look at a research project that would also provide a price support or a floor for these producers electing to, to grow this crop. This uh, would allow uh, research to be done. Murray will, will gather the data as they work to establish which varieties and management practices are better uh, for producing this. And farmers have a, a safety net to come in and, and know there will be uh, at least some level of payment in case there is a complete failure on the crop or the, the yields are not to where they would need to be. Uh, this this total project cost is uh, uh, well from ag development side seven hundred or two hundred and forty seven thousand of that Murray's putting in twenty five thousand and rest of the matching fund is actually coming from the uh, uh, the company there that is buying this this flooring is gaining in popularity as a lot of uh, buildings are having to be at uh, net neutral or zero carbon and I'm aware of a couple of schools in Kentucky that are that are utilizing this flooring so it's a uh, it's it's fascinating uh, uh, and, and very proud we have this in Kentucky, and we think that this can be a, a market that uh, that is sustainable. This is a two-year project, and uh, the hope is this, after two years, enough research will be done, and uh, we'll, we'll see uh, the, the farmers producing this and, and seeing this company, which is growing, is to, uh, be able to, to source um, the majority, if not all, of their products from Kentucky. And I included in the packet a, a, a great article on uh, the fiber hemp showing, uh, showing some of the, the opportunities that we have. All right, I'll move on to page 16, give you an update on the a new startup business, Sunflower Fuels LLC. So they they were approved for one hundred fifty thousand dollars as part of a four hundred forty thousand dollar project to include a feasibility study to look in growing energy crops, miscanthus and other biomass grasses in eastern Kentucky on reclaimed uh, landmines like our uh, mine lands. Thank you, for, uh, Senator Webb, and in eastern Kentucky to see if it's feasible as a scale-up types project. So expect this to be completed by the end of 2024 and would have a business plan as a result of this feasibility study that would indicate whether it'd be possible or feasible to grow uh, biomass grasses as uh, support biofuels in uh, eastern Kentucky. All right, on page 17 is our final project uh, from the, the Purchase Co-op. Mayfield Grain, which is a regional grain elevator, was, uh, was destroyed in the December 2021 tornadoes and that, that affected Kentucky. 
uh, last year, the owners of uh, Mayfield Grain, or I guess actually uh, went throughout the year and then made the decision early in 2023 that they will not be rebuilding this facility. This leaves a, uh, um, a vacuum in, a, in an area that touches a lot of counties there uh, for, for a, an elevator or a market for their grain. Been a number of farm uh, meetings taking place, looking at options, uh, to, to establish in one option uh, they're exploring is looking at establishing a co-op to re to rebuild this market basing it uh, largely on, on the model of what Hopkinsville elevator has been able to do uh, but obviously this going to be a very uh, capital intense project and so the first step is getting a feasibility study to see if this is going to be be practical and so this is what the application uh, presented at the state level was for. The matching funds come from the Kentucky corn growers, and I think this is just a, a great testament of the, the synergy that we get in Kentucky with collaborative efforts and seeing a commodity group uh, putting their funds in to help their producers establish a market. So it's a total of uh, uh, 15500 with uh, half coming from the state and half coming from the Kentucky corn growers. Okay, Representative King. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just wondering what these 300 to 350 farm families have been doing with their crop since that was destroyed. Well, that's that's been the concern is uh, th those bushels have gone somewhere. And so that's uh, working on how to, to, to be able to bring those those bushels back i think there's been a lot of grain storage that has been built uh, again when you've got the local markets you have uh, more flexibility with delivery at harvest but um, that, that that'll be reflected in the the study because you want to make sure you, you're going to be able to, to be able to have those bushels back but the the short answer to well no <laughs> there's no short answers from brian uh the uh the, the 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 answer for that is the the burden has become more on the farmers that they're either having to haul further so that is uh, increasing their transportation cost or um, uh, or sell more at market uh, at at market at the the harvest time which usually has the highest basis and take an economic hit so either way it's costing the producers more to, to sell their grain somewhere else based on the location of these counties can one of the study data points be did they take it out of state i mean you can't blame them for finding a market, but if they can, you know, let us know if they had to go out of state to market their product. Well, I, I can say it did. There, oh, there, okay. there are a number of uh, markets across the state line that uh, that I know that they okay. they were utilizing. Thank you. Not, and I, not and I believe faulting them. that. Well, no, they they well, they'll have to them. find it, and that that's what uh -huh. they'll they'll look at. Mm -hmm. We did a did a similar. Um, a study. I was actually worked for Hopkins Elevator at the time when uh, when we had this uh, engaged for looking at one in Central Kentucky, and that's exactly what it looks lo at: is uh, you know what are the opportunities, and then where are the other markets that you're you're going to be competing with. Thank you, thank you, Madam it's a Chair. Great question. And we've had some of the corn growers utilize the Ag Finance Program to increase their uh, capa storage capacity with grain bins, so they are using the Ag Finance Program to do that. Anything else? And that uh, we we and the last thing in your packet is the press release uh, listing all these. I don't see any questions. Anything else you want to leave us with? No, like a field trip would be a great opportunity <laughs> to get out of Frankfurt sometime. But uh, always a pleasure to be here with you all, and thank you for your work. Well, thank you for both for your time and for your service. All right, I see our next guest has has made it. So our next agenda item is the Kentucky Double Dollars Program, and Mr. Richards. Please join us. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it has been, let me see, well, thank you. And I'm joined today with Kimmy Ishmael, who uh, many of you have, have met over the last two sessions. Um, so a lot has a lot has happened since the last time we talked um, here in Kentucky. We're still, you know, recovering from tornadoes, from flooding, um, <clears throat> things like that. Um, so 2022 was a <clears throat> challenging year. Um, in addition to that, um, I want to, you know, bring up some other things that we have been involved in. So we were asked and I participated in this task force to help inform uh, the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. Um, that new national strategy was released back in October. 
Um, we also submitted um, another USDA GUSNIP proposal uh, to support the, the SNAP fruits and vegetables part of Kentucky Double Dollars. We did that last year. Uh, I am sorry to say we did not get that uh, that grant, and um, and it was really discouraging. And, and you know we have done a lot since then. For one, is there's a huge demand in this country for that grant, and they only had uh, 38 million um, in fiscal year 2022, and um, only eight um, applicants got funded for that. And our analysis showed that um, those eight were primarily on the West Coast, on the East Coast, <laughs> and primarily in urban areas, right? So that's a red flag. And um, I have been on a bit of a tear for the last year, pointing that out to folks. Um, every opportunity I had, uh, I've had. The the really good thing is that um, Kentucky Ag Development Fund and and kudos to the Ag Policy uh, team stepped up um, and said, "All right, we will cover uh, that SNAP portion uh, for Kentucky Double Dollars for the next two years." So our goal had been to let's at least keep the program at the level we were at um, in 2022 um, so we don't lose any momentum in the state. Um, and we also then just submitted another uh, just in early May 6th, I think, submitted our next round. Um, meanwhile, I was uh, asked to testify in front of the the. U.S. Senate Agriculture uh, Subcommittee on Food and Nutrition in December, and I did that at the request of Senator Cory Booker and Senator Mike Braun, um, and specifically just told them, like, what's going on in Kentucky, you know, and how the issues of food access, food security, you know, coupled with the opportunity to support agriculture, especially beginning farmers and disadvantaged farmers, um, uh, Commissioner Quarles also submitted a written uh, letter uh, at that time, too. Um, and then, in part of the bigger efforts, and we've been talking to you all for the last couple of years about this, um, thanks to the sponsor of co-chair uh, Myron Dossett, uh, we were introduced House Bill 384 this past year that would set up um, this fund, the Healthy Farm and Food Innovation Fund, um, that would to one, to respond to the most immediate need um, to come up with the federal, the matches for required for these federal grants, not only the GUSNIP grant, but a number of other USDA grants have matches anywhere from 25 to 50%. Um, but I think in our conversations with you all over the last two years, we're all realizing that we have a much better, much bigger need and situation um, in the state. And then um, lastly, uh, just this past April, I was invited to be on a panel at the National, at this uh, National Food is Medicine Summit in, in Boston. Um, <clears throat> I was honored to be there. I was also a little, a little surprised, right? Um, there were over 300 attendees there. Um, there were only two people in all those 300 folks that had any experience in agriculture, myself, and former Secretary of Agriculture, Dan Glickman. <laughs> um, I'm pleased to say that there was a lot of conversations then about the importance of where food comes from and the connections between agriculture, food security, um, all of these issues. Um, and a couple things, right? I mean, this is some updated information. Um, and I think you'll, from our friends at Feeding Kentucky, you'll get even more updates about you know food security in the state. But, you know, we have a big problem in this country and a big problem that's costing us a lot of money. Um, you know, 85% right there, 85% of healthcare spending in this country is related to diet-related disease or illnesses, right? Stuff that we can take care of, right? Stuff that if we're proactive on, we can save money and make people um, healthier. Um, and some of these things I didn't know about, but this is just was presented there, right? And, and I think it's a response to, like, the opportunities that we have when we incorporate food and agriculture into this approach. Um, and, you know, again, I did not know that one in 10 U.S. jobs uh, are directly supported by food and agriculture. I bet it's higher in Kentucky, but um, that's just my speculation. 
Um, food is medicine. <clears throat> if you haven't heard that phrase yet, you're going to hear it. You're going to hear it a lot. Um, I, you know, from a Madison Avenue point of view, it is a really good catchphrase, right? I'm, I'm not so keen on it. But anyway, that's what we got, right? But that's what we're looking at, right? Um, and, you know, again, whether it's from a Medicare, Medicaid, cost saving point of view, from healthcare providers, everything, it is it is up and coming, right? Um, even in DC, right? The, when I was in December, that whole testimony was about food as medicine. And you know that an issue is finally getting traction when folks in DC are talking about it, right? Um, so again, some, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna breeze through it, you know, other than the fact that, yeah, in Kentucky, we got problems with food security. You know, we rank terrible when it comes to nutritional health um, for our state. You know, again, th those aren't numbers there. Um, our rankings are anything to be proud of, but they also do represent a great opportunity. Um, <clears throat> and again, you know, these numbers, right? Um, I am really pleased to say that um, Community Farm Alliance, along with a whole bunch of partners, including funding with ag development, you know, we have pretty, three pretty robust programs that directly address some of these issues and are directly to tied to supporting Kentucky farmers. After all, that's what Community Farm Alliance does, right? Um, and Kentucky Ag Development Fund is supporting the Farmers Market Support Program and Kentucky Double Dollars. They have done that now for coming up on six years, what is 23? I'm going to take my shoes off to kind of cipher that out. Um, <clears throat> at least six years uh, for that. Um, <clears throat> and these aren't like one-off standalone programs. They are really part of, um, a, a, again, a much more bigger effort that all these, we that all these cogs and these wheels are so important um, <clears throat> to actually make things happen. Again, one of this is a farmer's market support program. So, you know, we, along with KDA, you know, help provide technical assistance to Kentucky farmers markets with the goal of making them more sustainable and also making them more professional and more sophisticated um, in terms of marketing, in terms of outreach, in terms of pricing, everything right uh, for the long term sustainability and just, you know, in the last two, you know, well, last two or three years here, right, uh, it's been 41 markets in 31 counties. And consistently every year, about a thousand farmers are part of, are impacted through our programs here. And that $146,000, that is Kentucky Ag Development Funds uh, specifically. And um, we did some testimony last November in front of the Interim Joint Committee about um, response to East Kentucky flooding. This is just one, one slide from that. But I think one thing that we, we learned last year um, was that over these last five, six, seven years of efforts to support you know, local food systems and farmers markets, We've actually created this infrastructure, um, you know, in in Kentucky and specifically in Appalachia, right? Infrastructure that when the flooding happened was able to jump in right away, right? So, you know, these four these four free markets, um, you know, there was a collaborative effort there, but you know, responding and creating these four free markets again allowed farmers to continue to receive some in income. And those folks, especially those food insecure folks, again, to get food, right? And all this is supported by uh, this collaborative effort. <clears throat> Some of these other slides are just going to be repeats from what you, I've said over the past years. Again, Kentucky Double Dollars. Goal is to increase sales to farmers and, you know, make more food af affordable and accessible to um, folks who really need it the most and to leverage all these federal dollars um, that uh, are coming into Kentucky and support farmers. And again, Kentucky Double Dollars is actually four incentive programs uh, supporting the WIC and the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition programs, as well as SNAP, fruits and vegetables, and then the SNAP meat, eggs, and dairy. Um, and again, outside of the SNAP fruits and vegetables, <clears throat> the other, other three are supported by Kentucky Ag Development Funds, plus other private funds that come into us 
on a yearly basis, you know, through some foundations. Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky is a big supporter. Um, I'm really proud to say that this year, CoBank, who I didn't know existed, but is connected with Farm Credit, um, is helping out this year. Because, you know, our goal this year was to maintain what we did last year, right? Those markets. Well, unbeknownst to us, we had about a half a dozen other markets that say, oh, we want to be part of this this year, right? So that means that we're, you know, working on raising num raising more funds for this. So we've had to put a number of markets on kind of a waiting list, um, but we're getting funding and we're going to, you know, roll them off. And I feel pretty confident that all the markets who requested to be part of Kentucky Double Dollars will be a part of it this year. Um, and this was, and I apologize that I put the 2021 um, graphic there, but that's just a snapshot of where our efforts were uh, last year in 2022 in Kentucky. Um, <clears throat> this is part of uh, the this report. We did this five-year impact report that you all have a copy of, um, <clears throat> you know, to, to show. Um, and we started, again, we started receiving ag development funds in 2017. Up until that point, it was pri mainly private philanthropy um, <clears throat> that supported this. One thing to point out is that <clears throat> 2021 was a high point, right? And that was largely due to COVID um, and increase in pandemic EBT funds that came into the state. And, we, you know, we honored all of that. And then we hit 2022, right? A lot of that PEBT funding and, and overall SNAP funding dropped. And then we had the floods in East Kentucky, and it shut down at least four markets, you know, basically for, for most of the season. So that's why 2022 is lower than it was um, in 2023. Um, again, the last thing, um, and again, thank you so much to Representative Dossett um, for, for sponsoring this bill. Um, but I think in order to sustain these type, these type of programs, not just the one that CFA runs, but other programs that are out there. Some of them are on a local level, some of them are on a multi-county level, um, is creating this fund, right? Um, and, you know, it, creating this fund that, you know, is administered right now, I think we were saying administered um, with the Kentucky, uh, Kentucky Department of Agriculture, and I think they're still receptive. Uh, we'll see with the whoever the new uh, commissioner is. Um, but the fund is able to not only, you know, receive state funds, um, but also private funds, again, as more and more uh, health care providers. And the MCOs have supported this project for CFA, um, Passport, WellCare, United, um, Humana Foundation just gave us uh, a new grant this year to help support these efforts, too. Um, but by having that that fund set up and capable of receiving, you know, all these funds, um, it really sets Kentucky up to be on the same level as how many is other states have set these funds up? Is it like 14? I'm thinking, you know, um, and it allows, you know, folks like us when we make a GUSNIP application um, to to show that we there's ultimate other sources to provide that 50% match. And it allows us, you know, to bring down more of those federal dollars. Um, and I think we're, we're working, or at least Kimmy and uh, Representative Dossett are in constant communications and we'll see what uh, what we can bring, bring to you all uh, for the next session. So that's it for me. I am happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much for your update and presentation. And we'll start with Representative King. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. In years past, electronic checkout at farmers markets has been explained to me as a barrier to taking advantage of these programs. Are we doing any better on that across the state? Uh, can you give me an update on electronic checkouts? I, I think the answer is yes, right? The um, Department of Agriculture um, has, has really been handling that and supporting. So if a farmer's market wants to accept SNAP EBT, the first stop is to go to Department of Agriculture. Although our team, like, they'll reach out to us and we'll, we'll talk to them about everything that's involved, how to apply for it. But Department of Agriculture can then help with the actual getting of the machine or the costs associated with that. Thank you. Chair Dawson? 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to take a moment to applaud Kimmy. Her pers she was persistent and very enthusiastic as far as working with me on what we put together for House Bill 384. I will be filing that again. Uh, we were able to get it uh, there to the uh, through through committee. Uh, weren't we were late in the session when weren't able to get it to a vote. But uh, I want to take a moment and applaud her and let you know, pat her on the back. She worked <laughs> extremely hard as far as getting this legislation put together. Thank you, Kimmy. Yes, she is amazing. Um, right now, her attentions have, have turned to the Farm Bill. And we have sent members to D.C. Well, starting with me in December, we have had members and staff in D.C. every month um, working on the Farm Bill um, you're scheduled to go back in June, right? Uh, specifically to talk about, or try to encourage Congress to put more money into the GusNet program, right? Um, to meet meet the needs out there. Fantastic. I don't see any other updates. I'm well aware of your work in Fayette County with the double dollars and programs. It's been wildly successful, very yes. supportive of the effort, yep. and it's critical to have more people have more access to fresh food. So thank you very much for your work and thank, your updates. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to our last item on the agenda, the Farms to Food Banks. I think we have Ms. Vaughn and Ms. Wheeler here with us. Welcome. It's the end of this presentation. No. <laughs> Do you have a presentation? Yes. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you all so much for having us. Uh, so my name is Cassidy Wheeler. For those of you all who don't know me, I'm the advocacy coordinator with Feeding Kentucky. Um, I'll let my partner introduce herself too before we get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Vaughn, the programs director for Feeding Kentucky and our Farms to Food Banks program. So we have some new information for you on the state of hunger in Kentucky, and then we'll kind of get into our um, various programs. So we just got from Feeding America actually a couple weeks ago um, the new numbers for food insecurity in Kentucky from 2021. So as of, again, as of 2021, we're looking at one in eight adult Kentuckians who are food insecure and one in six children. Um, so these numbers have stayed about the same. We sometimes see one in seven adults, sometimes one in eight. Um, but pretty consistently, these are similar numbers. And then here are the counties with the highest food insecurity rates in Kentucky. Um, so Wolf County is our number one food insecure county. And actually, Wolf County ranks seventh in the top 10 food insecure counties in the country. Um, so and, the, and then the, the other counties listed here are not super far behind. So Wolf County's food insecurity rate is, I think, 24 percent. And then these other counties are between 21 and 23 percent. So here's some interesting numbers. Um, and if you look at the handouts I've given you, you have kind of the, each page is a different year, 2019, 2020, 2021. So you can kind of see the breakdown um, of food insecurity across the state. But some interesting kind of highlights of them is that food insecurity actually went down by 1.5% from 2019 to 2021. Um, and we can attribute that to a lot of the policies that were happening during the pandemic, right? We saw a much greater need um, for food, lot, like growing rates of hunger and food insecurity, um, and policymakers like yourselves obviously um, help pass policy to combat that. So a lot of federal policies address this nationally too, so looking at ARPA funds, the SNAP emergency allotments, um, the flexibilities for serving school me meals to kids, you know, all of those policies worked very well. They did what they intended to do. So. It's very exciting to have the hard numbers to see, right, that your efforts were not in vain. Um, something also interesting, so like I said, food insecurity went down a percentage and a half, which is hugely significant. And in Kentucky, that is 65,000 people. So, you know, we managed to pull 65,000 people out of food insecurity um, from 2019 to 2021. So obviously that is hugely significant. And then also if you're looking at 
the data from 2020 compared to 2021, you'll see that the average meal cost in Kentucky went up over 30 cents. So it went from 2.79 a meal to 3.11. Um, so that's a pretty big jump. But in spite of the rise in food costs, our food insecurity rate remained the same, um, which is about 12.9%, right? So, you know, again, we'll see that despite the fact that there were, you know, rising food costs, inflation, um, things like that, we managed because of these, these sound policy um, to keep our food insecurity rate the same. Um, and so, you know, like I said, we're very excited to have these numbers because... Again, they show that these policy solutions worked. We are pushing for some permanent policy changes because obviously a lot of these pandemic era programs are now going away. Um, so we're afraid that these numbers will revert back to 2019 levels. Um, so something to think about as we're going into next session, right, is how do we create some permanent policy change to make sure that we're not going backwards. Yeah, and so this is the 2021 <clears throat> food insecurity report. So you have this in your handout. Um, and like I said, you can kind of compare this to years past. But this really gives you a rundown of what the food insecurity rate is in Kentucky and how it looks on a county by county basis. So I do want to point out, especially if you compare this to 2019, um, you'll see that we have really improved our food insecurity um, on a county by county basis. And even though the food insecurity rate for the state remain the same in 2020 and 2021, you'll see that it actually went down by counties. Um, so when you compare them right in 2020, you see a lot more dark colored counties. And so that's higher food insecurity rate. Um, and that number, you know, most of them are not that dark color in 2021. And you see a lot more lighter colored counties in 2021. And that's a lower food insecurity rate. So if we're looking at it county by county, we're actually doing better with food insecurity. And then I think that this is something that we talked about last year, but um, Kentucky does have one of the highest rates of hunger for older adults and seniors. Um, so we are number two in the nation for hunger um, for older adults aged 50 to 59. And we are, I think we're maybe fourth in senior hunger, we're top five. Um, so we have a very high rate both of child hunger and older adult and senior hunger here. And then this is just highlighting what we've already talked about. Our food insecurity rate right now is 12.9%. Um, and then, you know, this key here shows who is eligible to receive SNAP benefits and who isn't. And then we saw, so these are some older numbers, um, but we, we have been seeing... <laughs> A rise in need since some of these pandemic era policies ended. Um, so it's still probably pretty relevant, right? So we saw an increase of 18% um, nationally in food insecurity once the pandemic hit. And our food banks are seeing a much higher demand. So kind of the way that our partners have experienced it is the pandemic hit, we saw an increased need. Then there were policy solutions that passed that kind of you know, made that level out a little bit. And then as these policies are ending, we're seeing a much, much higher need um, from the food banks and the food pantries, right? And it's very complicated on their end as well because of inflation and the high cost of food and the supply chain. They're having a very hard time um, buying food, essentially, both getting it and also purchasing it, right? The purchasing power of their federal funding, um, and their donations isn't going as far. So even though we are seeing such a huge need um, from, you know, Kentuckians, our neighbors, it's harder for the food banks and pantries to meet that need than it was in the initial stages of the pandemic. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing to address these issues that Cassidy explained. Um, well, for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, we are a statewide um, nonprofit organization that is made up of a network of seven food banks and over 800 um, partner feeding agencies. Um, we serve on average about 50,000 Kentuckians each week and 85 million meals were served to Kentuckians in need in our last fiscal year. Um, 
this is a little bit talking about our needs that we we could use some help with. Um, we could use more brick and mortar infrastructure, cold storage, um, continued flexibility in school and federal nutrition programs, and fewer barriers to access SNAP benefits. Um, and did you? We're going to talk about that later. Um, and but I wanted to talk about farms to food banks. That's really what I my specialty. Um, so farms to food banks redistributes agricultural products from farmers needing a market and gives those to Kentuckians in need. Um, there's three main goals of farms to food banks: to increase access, to support farmers, and to reduce waste of edible food. So last year, we distributed 3.4 million pounds of produce to 119 counties. Um, there was one county that did not receive produce. That was Ballard County, and it, um, which is over in western Kentucky. Um, and it's my understanding that they were offered produce but weren't able to accept it at the time. And it doesn't necessarily mean they didn't get any produce at all. They just didn't get produce from farms to food banks. So... Um, we distribute 28 different types of produce and um, the equivalent of 5.6 million meals. Mm -hmm. So the impact on farmers, um, last year we worked with 276 farmers from 53 counties in Kentucky. Um, on average, a farmer got about $3,400, um, but 12 farmers received more than $10,000. So you kind of... it. It varies the quantities that the pr farmers are bringing in. We've taken something as small as a 10-pound sack of potatoes to as large as a semi-truck full of goodies. So um, it just depends on the size of the farm. And just here recently, starting this year, we were awarded a grant called LFPA. That stands for the Local Food Purchase Assistance Cooperative Agreement Program. Um, it's a USDA grant that was awarded to the Kentucky Department of Ag, and they sub-awarded these funds to us. Um, but it's a two-year grant period, and we're we are trying to focus on purchasing protein items with these funds because the the um, appropriation that we get from the state is for fresh produce only so we are trying to utilize this money to expand and get protein items as well and we've been working with um, one of the goals of this grant is to work with socially disadvantaged producers so we've been reaching out trying to find farmers who who fit that criteria um, and are wanting to work with us and we're able to pay a little bit more um, closer to retail price for for the um, products So we want to be able to continue this work that Sarah is doing with um, LFPA. Um, so currently the Farms to Food Banks program is only for produce and Sarah does such an amazing job with it that we have really kind of hit a wall with what we're able to do. We're kind of maxed out on produce. Um, so really, I mean, like we get to a point every year where Sarah has basically bought all the produce that is available to us. Um, so we're looking at expanding the program because, you know, we obviously have the ability to do so. There is a need, right, both for farmers, for folks um, in need of food and to make sure that, the, that um, you know, farmers products aren't going to waste. Um, so, you know, I want to I do want to thank you all very much for your support of the program um, and, you know, we really appreciate you all funding Farms to Food Banks in the budget every other year. And as session kind of comes closer, um, I will certainly be reaching out to all of you to talk about, right, uh, what the Farms to Food Banks program in future looks like. But we're really wanting to expand the program. Um, so we're going to be asking for a $1 million, $1 million line item in this year's budget. Um, so right now, like I said, we're really limited to produce and we want to expand it to include protein. This is something we've been talking about. This is a need we're seeing um, from, you know, our food banks, our farmer partners, et cetera. And then we also want to incorporate an element working with youth. Um, so, you know, bringing in programs like FFA and 4-H, we want to, you know, bring in the youth and kind of the idea being that, you know, the long term goal of bringing in youth and getting them into farming um, and agriculture as a career, right, making it more sustainable. So. These are kind of the two ways that we're looking at expanding the program and, like I said, continuing this work that we've done with um, our LFPA grant. So, again, you know, we really appreciate all of the Just support. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Representative Webb? 
Senator Webb? <laughs> I've been, bo I've been both. We answered, <laughs> um, answered anything. Uh, I would just ask uh, what your vision of the incorporation of protein uh, would look like. I'm not mm -hmm. going to hold you to it, but what, uh, give us an indication of what your intentions are. Um, well, we would like to work with local producers, mm -hmm. and um, we do require that the, the protein is USDA inspect like was processed in a USDA inspected facility um but with with um but are with, you working with existing agencies uh, I mean existing associations like the cattle I see for FFA and 4-H I think that's uh, I think we all you know can relate to that mm -hmm. system uh have you talked to uh cattle producers or the swine producers or Yes, we, producers are, and, and, you know, or seeing how other, if other states are doing it and maybe a model for that. Because, I mean, I'm all about animal protein mm -hmm. and, and as a producer, but I, I just was going to uh, kind of curious as to how you would incorporate that. Well, we, we have been, we've partnered with the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association and also the Pork Producers Association, a lot of our commodity groups, um, and we would hope to continue working with them. They've donated money to us in the past to use to purchase protein and we really appreciate um their partnership but yes we would we would certainly plan to continue working with them well and, and but i mean if we're gonna ask for a million dollar appropriation i mean i would like to have a, a plan in place and have the stakeholder input and have a model that we could hang our hat on that million dollar appropriation so between mm -hmm. now and then and because, you know, we're already starting budget work. So, Yeah, absolutely. And other states who run Farms to Food Banks programs, some of them do, they include protein in their Farms to Food Banks models. Um, and, you know, like Sarah said, we have these partnerships already and we are, you know, getting donations um, and in some instances maybe purchasing protein, right, depending on, right. Um, so it's, it's more about kind of incorporating it into a more sustainable program, but that is something that we'll definitely hash out the details of. Um, I think, you know, Sarah and Mike Halligan from God's Pantry and I have kind of talked about maybe this summer trying to really nail down the details of it. So that's something that we can provide you well, with. And Hunters for the Hungry as well. Mm -hmm. So, when, mm -hmm. you know, we've done that before. So. Yes, because in, in the past, you. we've right. never had any substantial funding mm -hmm. that allowed us to purchase protein. So it's kind of new for us um, being able to do so. But we um, that's what we're hoping. We're learning a lot with the LFPA grant and, and mm -hmm. we're meeting a lot of new farmers. There's a whole untapped market of meat that we have never <laughs> explored before. So we're very excited to learn more and. Yeah, and that is kind of the the excellent thing about LFPA is that, um, you know, if y'all fund us to expand to protein, it won't be our first rodeo, right? We won't be making our mistakes with y'all. We're doing it right now with the, the LFPA grant. So hopefully, you know, that will also inform, you know, we'll know what has gone well and what needs to be changed. Thank you. Representative King. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have one observation and two questions, if I may. Thank you. Uh, can we go back to slide six, please? <laughs> there we go. Um, I, I track the unemployment numbers every month as they come in mm -hmm. to us as legislators. And I notice the direct correlation of these are our highest unemployment counties uh, in the state. So referring back to your map for the 2021 mm -hmm. uh, data, do you see that correlation overall? Is it as simple as in our areas that folks are more employed, that this is less of a problem and it's directly mm -hmm. tied to unemployment? Is uh, it that simple or is well, are I there other situations? I think yes. Um, they are related. I, I don't think that it is cause and effect of one necessarily, right? Like, I, I don't think that it is simply like, oh, people are unemployed, so that's making them hungry, because we obviously know that there are a multitude of factors at play with food insecurity. But I think, you know, the, the greater kind of structural systemic causes, right? Like, you know, we know that southeastern Kentucky 
obviously often is struggling because of, you know, like lack of infrastructure, lack of support, et cetera. So I think we have maybe this, you know, greater causation of multiple kind of systemic issues that are creating unemployment, which is contributing to food insecurity. Um, So yes and no, I definitely think the two are related for sure. Okay, and then in requests that the the General Assembly uh, address that, I think we are as far as getting more people employed and improving mm-hmm. that workforce participation rate that comes up mm-hmm. in every conversation we have here in Frankfurt. And then my final question is looking at the map and knowing these are our one, four, five, six mm-hmm. highest food insecurity counties, is, is there any merit to uh, diverting some of the help from the lighter green areas and getting more into these folks or is that heresy and a logistical nightmare? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. That's a good question. And I think I think I would like to think more, or look more about what that would actually look like, you know, um, because I do think, for example, you know, God's Pantry in Lexington does an amazing job, but they have the biggest service area in the state. They are serving the most counties and they are serving all but maybe three counties of eastern Kentucky, which obviously, you know, that is an enormous ask. Um, so and, you know, I don't I don't think that. I think that in all of Kentucky, we see huge areas of need. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think looking at where could we specifically divert funds to is not a bad idea or maybe not even funds, maybe you know, structural support, maybe volunteer work, maybe awareness campaigns. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I think these kind of regional focus of like, okay, these counties are doing, they're doing better. So let's look at these kind of darker counties. I think that that is a good, I think that's a, that's a good idea. I like that direction. I think that I would like to see, yeah, I think it would depend on what that actually looked like. But yeah, I think that that's a good inclination for sure. Thank you. Representative Rourke. Thank you. On slide 16, you mentioned several needs that the organization Mm -hmm. has, including brick and mortar infrastructure, cold storage. Um, With those types of physical infrastructure, um, do you imagine like one time allocations or like one central location or are you imagining something more spread out throughout the state? Well, I was just going to say, like, specifically in regards to the the tornado that happened in western Kentucky, I know that our the warehouse there at the the pad warehouse in Mayfield was um, destroyed and they have a temporary site in Paducah. Um, Mm -hmm. So there were there were some and then the flooding also destroyed lots of pantries and or well, not lots of pantries, but it it damaged lots of pantries and destroyed a couple pantries in eastern Kentucky. So um, and we do have some funders who have stepped up to try to help um, rebuild and um, expand the especially in regards to the cold storage. Um, But but those continue to be needs that Mm -hmm. in even like something that we may a food pantry may have never thought of, like to have a generator on hand in case the power goes out that up until like the past year or two that may not have been something that was on their minds but now it's becoming something that might be necessary um because when you've got valuable items perishable items um you need some way to keep them safe to eat if the power goes out i think too you know if we are looking at expanding our farms to food banks program to include protein, um, that will require more infrastructure, more cold storage, right? You can't just let meat sit anywhere. Um, And, you know, I visited various pantries, like I'm thinking specifically of God's Outreach in Richmond. I don't know if any of you all have been there, but um, they have a huge food pantry. You know, there's there's a big need in Madison County. Um, And so they're always expanding. And I think a lot of their infrastructure needs are met with donations. But when I was visiting there, I think about a month ago, they were, you know, telling me we would like to expand produce but we don't have the cold storage um so and and it kind of comes and it goes right sometimes we talk with food banks and pantries and what they're saying is like we don't have enough food um and then sometimes they're saying well we've had to turn away donations because we don't have the space um so which you know the other thing is uh, Martin mentioned the farm bill. That's something that we're kind of working with is um, TFAP funding, right? That's, you know, the federal program that um, food banks use to dispense food once a month, but it also includes storage and equipment. 
So there are several different avenues that we could explore for that. And, you know, like Sarah said, we have, I think, almost 900 food pantries across the state. Some of them are just, you know, they don't even have like a separate building. They're simply like working out of a church or something like that. Um, And then some of them are huge, like their buildings are comparable to food bank sizes. So there are lots of different needs. And just one follow up um, in terms of we've talked a little bit about obviously our goal here is to make sure that more people are employed so that they you know don't need assistance. But ultimately, um, you mentioned fewer barriers to access to SNAP um, with that. What are the biggest barriers that you're seeing um, that, you know, we could make a difference in? Um, well, several, there are many barriers, right? So the majority of SNAP recipients actually aren't people who are unable to work. So 73% of SNAP households in Kentucky have children, um, and about 40% of them have seniors or disabled adults, right? So the, we, I mean, we obviously do see SNAP recipients who are working adults and the majority of them are working already. Um, So, you know, we, the anti-hunger advocates, including myself, we're very concerned about the conversations happening on the federal level about time limits and work reporting requirements, right? Because again, we know that the people who are receiving SNAP who are able to work are working. Um, And I think a big barrier that I see for folks receiving SNAP is the application process um, and the reporting requirements, right? I mean, like I know every year when I do my taxes, when I hit submit, I'm like, well, I hope all that was right because, you know, I'm not great at that. So, I mean, navigating these kinds of cumbersome applications, especially for folks who already have um, a lot of struggles, you know, we see a lot of SNAP recipients who, for example, are single moms, um, you know, their biggest concern is feeding their kids, paying their bills. It's difficult to navigate these application process. It's almost impossible to get through um, on a phone, you know, phone call. You may not have the right tools to access it online. You may not have internet, maybe not laptops. So these kinds of cumbersome reporting processes are very much a barrier. Thank you. Representative Reed. Thank you, Madam Chair. What's the qualifying definition that you all use or what's the metric for insecure? What's that dynamic look like? So we use Feeding America's standard. um, And I, I'll be honest, I can't, off the top of my head, I'm not sure that I remember it correctly, but it has to do with um, like, have you, um, like, have, have you not had access to food in the past week have you not um, been able to replace food that maybe like if there has been some sort of you know disaster or something that has gone bad have you not been able to purchase food do you not know where your next meal is it's like those sorts of questionnaires um i can get you the specific metric that they use though but yes it's a it's about having um consistent access to nutritious like food to nourish your body so you might be filling your belly but it's not with or if right. only we see a lot of folks who are eating like one meal a day. So, yeah, it's that sort of thing. Like, are you getting three meals a day? Is it enough to nourish you? Do you know where your next meal is coming from? If something happened, could you replace that food, et cetera? So is it based on calorie intake, like the 2000 calorie intake suggestion? I'm not sure about that, culture? but I can we Does can that get fall you that in at all with that metric. I don't think it's as much caloric as it is like what are you eating would this be considered you know what I'm saying like you know we see a lot of folks who maybe will eat for a meal like a can of peaches and a piece of bread and you know obviously that's not a nutritious or well-rounded meal thank you chair Dawson uh yes real briefly I want to come back to the issue you were talking about on the applications for the Mm snap benefits I think it's going to be incumbent upon us as legislators, whether in the House or the Senate, to encourage the cabinet to become more customer friendly to these individuals applying because, Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, they may not have access Mm -hmm. to email. The other thing is a young single mother may be making an application while they're trying to work. Uh, They do not Mm -hmm. have the ability to make phone calls at Mm -hmm. any time they're on there for 30 minutes an hour Mm -hmm. in the uh queue to be uh uh, to Mm -hmm. be answered or they get the call back 
and they're not they may call back but that individual is ha- unable to answer the phone at the mm-hmm. time of that call so they should be returning a phone call, uh, call back to those individuals mm-hmm. that make an application but i think it's something as i said we as legislators mm-hmm. need to make sure we encourage the cabinet uh, to become more customer friendly to help these individuals mm-hmm. be able to access uh, yeah. these these type of opportunities yeah, I uh, thank you so much for pointing that out because that is absolutely so true. And there's lots of room for administrative advocacy changing either, yeah, the application requirements, the reporting requirements. You know, we have um, an elderly simplified application that is for seniors who are accessing SNAP to make it easier on them. Um, and yeah, I mean, we could definitely stand to have more folks who are doing SNAP outreach. You know, that is a very understaffed, underfunded area. Um, So, yeah, I think you're right on the money, right? That is a need that we have, and there are administrative opportunities to simplify that. Thank you. I know you have a few more slides. Just a couple. Okay. Okay, so finally, I wanted to hit on our Kentucky Kids Eat program. Um, So this is a program that we run in tandem with um, Share Our Strength. Um, So we have specifically a No Kid Hungry director who is her entire job is focused on um, feeding kids in Kentucky. So we do a lot of specifically trying to bolster school meals, um, address feeding outside of school, right? So doing like summer meals, um, supper, et cetera, et cetera. And I did want to give you all a brief update on Senate Bill 151 that passed the session before this past one. Um, So we have some numbers on how that has impacted schools in Kentucky, and they're really amazing. It had a huge positive impact. So I want to thank you all once again for um, supporting this policy and helping helping us get it passed. Um, So Senate Bill 151, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, made it so schools could use up to 15 minutes of instructional time um, during the classroom for kids to eat breakfast. Um, And also for those of you you all who don't know me, I used to be a public school teacher, so I was very excited about this. Um, So this removed barriers for kids to accessing breakfast. You know, there are lots of reasons why kids wouldn't be able to eat breakfast. You know, for example, I had a lot of students who their buses would be late or, you know, I think my school started at 720, so they maybe didn't want to have breakfast at 645, which seems fair to me. Um, And so not only did it eliminate barriers for kids to eat breakfast, but it also um, helped schools getting more federal reimbursement. So a big problem that school nutrition directors I've talked with recently have told me about is that they're not able to afford quality nutritious meals. Um, So school meals have a pretty high standard of, you know, what nutritious standards they have to meet according to USDA. And I've had multiple, multiple school nutrition directors tell me like, we cannot, we can't afford these meals or we can't get the food that we want. So in the past couple of years, we've seen food prices rise in schools about 20%, which is, of course, enormous. Um, So we do have this example from Harlan County. So their new school nutrition director told us that in just one of their schools last year, um, they saw they served more than 10,000 meals in September than they had the year previously. Um, And again, this was just at one school. And then their federal reimbursement also increased by over $26,000. So again, we're seeing, you know, 10,000 more meals served, right? More kids are getting breakfast. And we're seeing schools are getting more reimbursement so that they can provide these um, quality, nutritious meals. So it was a very, very successful policy. Thank you all so much for your support. We are exploring some more policy solutions. So we don't have anything permanent in the works. But we are thinking about doing some... um, more work around reducing barriers to school meals. So I will keep you all updated on that. And again, thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Are there any more additional questions or comments? All right, Ms. Vaughn, Ms. Wheeler, thank you so much for your presentation today. And we look forward to hearing more about your requests maybe in the next month or so. Yes, thank you all so much. And I will definitely get you all that information. Great, thank thank you. you. All right, seeing no business, our meeting's adjourned.